Welcome everyone to a, our six week webinar series that we are doing um, with some students here uh, who are taking a course that is in the Africana Studies Department and cross listed with sociology. Um, the course is Beyond Woke, so we're thinking about how we go beyond um, being woke to racial injustice um, and racism in America and around the globe. Uh, and the topic for this um, webinar series is looking at the concept of Sankofa. Uh, and so the students are going to be presenting uh, this evening on Sankofa, um, and we're gonna have a conversation on that. Um, in addition, we will also be having in future weeks, um, we'll be talking about um, some books and doing a common read. So uh, that's what uh, will be the basis of this webinar. But first, um, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Dr. Charmaine Jackson. Um, I am director of the Africana Studies Program and a sociologist here at Stetson. Um, and then I will just let the, I'll, I'll just uh, allow the students to go around and introduce yourselves. So, um, Julia, do you want to begin? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Julia. I'm a senior here at Stetson, and I'm majoring in psychology and minoring in sociology. Thank you, Julia. How about Simone? Hi, everyone. My name is Simone. I'm a senior right now here at Stetson. I am a sociology major with a minor in education. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, Zakira. Hi, my name is Zakira Williams. I am a political science major, business law minor on the pre law track here at Stetson University. Thank you, Zakira. Uh, how about Miera? Hi, I'm Miera. I'm a junior, uh, sorry, I'm a senior here. I'm a psychology major and a sociology minor. Thank you, Miera. DJ. Hey everybody, uh, DJ Murray, I'm a sociology major. Thank you, DJ. Savannah. Hi, I'm Savannah. I am a current senior here at Stetson and I am a chemistry major and a German minor. Thank you, Savannah. Tahia. Hello, my name is Tahia. I'm a public health major with a concentration in psychology, and I'm also a sociology and certificate of community engagement minor. Thank you, Tahia. Yasmin? Hi, everyone. I am a sociology major and on the pre law track. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you, Kajani. Um, Hey guys, my name is Kajani Alfred. Um, I am a, currently a sophomore here at Stetson. My major is political science and I have a minor in business law. Thank you, Kajani. Faith. Hi, I'm Faith. I am a senior here at Stetson currently and I am a health sciences major with a minor in psychology. Thank you, Faith. Mattia. Hi everyone. I'm Mattia and I'm a senior year. Um, I'm a business administration um, major. Thank you, Mattia. Um, and then uh, Brie is not feeling well, but she's also here. Um, and we have a couple of other students who are also in the webinar, not here this evening, um, but that will be joining us next week. All right, well, now that we've done some introductions, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sankofa. I'm gonna open up with, um, my Sankofa for this evening um, and, um, and what we're gonna talk about over the next six uh, weeks here. So, um, so the entire webinar series is based upon this concept of Sankofa, which is a Gahanian uh, symbol um, from the Akon tribe in Ghana. Um, it literally uh, can translate to, it is not taboo to fetch uh, what is at risk of being left behind. Um, so San being return, Ko is go, and Fa is to look 
um, seek or take. Um, and so we're utilizing this concept in this course to think about um, how we can retrieve what was lost or forgotten or collect um, past knowledge to uh, heal um, the present and move us into the future. So um, each week, uh, so this week we're going to have the conversation of what Sankofa means to me. Um, and several students have presentations. I will talk a little bit about something that popped up for me uh, and thinking about what Sankofa means to me. And um, we'll have some additional presentations. We won't have enough time to go through all of the presentations this evening. So we'll carry those on for next Wednesday. Um, and then for next week, we will be having a conversation about the Netflix documentary 13th. Um, this is a documentary that is really speaking to the 13th Amendment and how that was an amendment that abolished uh, involuntary servitude or uh, the enslavement of people, particularly African, well, African Americans, Black people in the United States. Um, in this documentary, it is a discussion of how the contemporary carceral system uh, replicates and has reproduced uh, many of the same challenges to full participation in American society um, through our, our prison, um, prison system, our legal system, our court system. Um, and so the students uh, will have discussion questions. So we encourage you uh, to join us for next week. Um, uh, in week three, we'll be dealing with the autobiography of Malcolm X as told by Alex Haley. Um, Yes, and uh, we'll go through um, some of the key points of his life. And again, thinking about uh, how we can use the story of Malcolm X to move beyond woke. Uh, what do we learn? What do we learn from, from his life? So uh, if you would like to go ahead and purchase this book, um, you can follow along as, as part of a, a common read. Um, but if you... Um, haven't read the book, certainly just come along for the conversation. Um, all of these weeks will be offered for cultural credit with the exception of this week. Um, the fourth week will be Thick and Other Essays, um, Trusty McMillan Cottom's book, um, really looking at issues of Black womanhood, Black girlhood, beauty standards, um, a series of essays uh, which are quite provocative and thinking about, um, again, how do we conceptualize race, gender, um, and opportunity um, in America. Um, in week five, we're going to be doing The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, a uh, book by Rebecca Sklut. Um, you know, and it opens up here, doctors took her cells without asking, those cells never died. They launched a medical revolution and a multi-million dollar industry more than 20 years later, her children found out their lives would never be the same. So really discussing the role, um, well, actually coming through the life of Henrietta Lacks, um, how do we understand things like health disparities and the ways in which black bodies um, have been harvested um, in the name of medical advancements um, and, and in the production of um, health. Um, but that doesn't actually benefit uh, the groups, you know, like African American or black people in, in general. Um, and then the final week, week six, we'll look at um, a book, uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing by Dr. Joy um, DeGroy or DeGru. Um, and here is an interesting um, sort of take on thinking about historical trauma, the ways in which trauma is passed on intergenerationally, again, sort of thinking about the body and the way the body can carry through uh, trauma, even if we in fact um, don't experience that particular trauma, in this case, it's slave trauma. Um, so an interesting, an interesting read to think about, um, right? So post-traumatic slave syndrome uh, being very similar to what you may have heard of, um, 
uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? But how um, how does you know how does post-traumatic slave um, syndrome manifest, and what can we use from from this knowledge to think about how we heal, right? How do we heal um, the legacy? of trauma of slavery, slavery in particular, but we can think about all the ways in which um, historical traumas happen. So um, that is in a nutshell what we are going to be doing over the next six weeks. Um, so hopefully you decide to join in, um, follow along, get the books, they're all, um, they may be available at the bookstore and then, uh, or you can get them on Amazon or however y'all libraries um, get books. Um, but uh, I think it should be a very interesting and thought provoking conversation uh, to really explore and expand how we might uh, think about uh, race, race and um and what it is to go beyond woke and Sankofa, right? This idea of retrieving what has been lost. So in all of these, right, is this idea, all of these books are the idea, you know, what's at the center of Malcolm X, Henrietta Lacks, Thick, uh, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome 13th is stories, right? It's human stories. And those are what are eternal. And oftentimes remembering our stories, remembering who we are, um, who our ancestors were, returning to retrieve what has been lost, um, lost in ourselves, right? In order for us to move forward into the um, future, but also to have a present. Um, there's a lot of trauma that exists uh, in everyday life. And that trauma is being played out in our own our own pathologies, our own depression, our anger, our frustrations, um, our silence, and, and then also being enacted, right, against one another um, in, our, in our everyday lives. We're experiencing uh, the accumulation of trauma, which is violence, and we can see that in a variety of aspects. And so um, really thinking about the way that story and knowing our story, knowing our truths, knowing who we come from, where we come from, our ancestors, what is our ancestral lineage? How do we heal that? Um, regardless, right, on whether you are Black or not, right, there is a history um, that's a collective history, right? This history of slavery, of enslavement, of the free versus the slave um, narrative, that, that push and pull of power dynamics. Um, is always seeking a kind of retribution, a kind of an atonement, a balancing um, of those past harms, or you know, sort of how do we, you know, people want to move forward without sort of thinking about where have we come from? How do we deal with accumulated advantage or accumulated disadvantage? You know, how do we begin to think about healing, like the healing work? And so um, Sankofa offers a concept to think about how we can do that. Um, and I think one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking about in this course, um, and we will continue in speaking over the next um, several weeks, is um, what you can do, right? Because uh, oftentimes we are over-focused on the other, and we don't have control over the other. I mean, certainly collectively, um, we make up the other, right? We make up society. But in truth, we really just have control over ourselves, right? That's the thing we have absolute immediate control over, our, our immediate space. Um, and so in thinking about how we can use our own energy to pour back into ourselves, to um, nourish ourselves and, and bring light back into ourselves and our communities. Right, um, and instead of over focusing on this sort of power struggle that does not tend to go anywhere, um, one of our classmates in here, one of our uh, co thinkers, um, Elijah, uh, who's not with us this evening but will be in future weeks, um, you know, has mentioned several weeks back, you know, it's, it feels like you're trying to mop up the ocean, and I've just loved that since he said it, right. And I said, well, why, yeah, you know, mopping up the ocean is extremely frustrating because you can't. So stop, 
stop trying to mop the ocean and start thinking about what you can do in your immediate circumstance and situation um, to begin to heal yourself and take care of yourself. If we all were starting to do that sort of self-care work, um, we began pulling our energy back and really lifting ourselves up, right? Lifting ourselves up and, um, and shifting, right? Shifting our power out of things that aren't really, we're not really interested in supporting and really putting our energy and focus into things we are. All right, so everyone has something different. The students have all prepared a PowerPoint. I didn't, um, but I have been interested in Rumi's poems um, and Sufism recently. So um, I have this like fun, um, it's an oracle deck. Um, so it's like a little inspirational card deck. Um, and this is called Rumi's Gifts. And it's put together by um, a woman, Ari Han Hanavar, Hanarvar. So I apologize if I've slaughtered that name, but um, she's an award-winning writer, visual artist, and speaker, um, and journalist who's interested in social justice, parenting, and um, mental health. But um, as she she created the Oracle deck. Um, she was interested in thinking about um, poetry and storytelling. Um, and she has in the introduction of her, um, of these cards, she says, when did my relationship with Rumi begin? Um, and to answer this, she has to go into the relationship Persians have with poetry. Um, and so I, um, uh, so I pulled a card out and it really made me think of, of Sankofa. So I want to share that first and then I'll go into how Persian poetry kind of links to this concept of, of Sankofa and my Sankofa. So I'll, I'll begin first. Uh, the card I got here is one called um, Ripening. And the poem that goes with it um, is by Rumi. And it says, uh, the Simorg which is a mythical giant, I'm sorry, a mythical bird gigantic enough to carry off an elephant or a whale. It sometimes appears as an amalgam of different animals and symbolizes attainment and auspiciousness. The Samorg of my heart is longing to fly again. Until now, this bird was content with ordinary desires. Now, the flame of her passion has burnt those seeds and she is soaring to the seven skies. The cauldron that stirred all my childish notions has finished simmering. All you see inside is eternal love. I am ready now. Um, and she goes on to write here, uh, the mythical bird, the smorg, is a symbol of maturity and maternal benevolence. It is said that when she flapped her great wings, it shook loose the seeds of all the plants and trees and sent them flying throughout the world. In our personal journey, the symbol of the Samorg represents readiness and realization. Our minds can become mature and dispel the childish notions of happiness that in reality make us restless and frustrated. We arrive at a moment where we are fulfilled and abundant and are ready to share our gifts with all. We know it is time to live now. So I think there's just a little more written on this. Um, the majestical mythical Simorg in this poem is full of hope and joy. The woman in the image has found her mystical power and is ready to share it with the world. She is, mag she is the magnificent bird herself and the words of the poem are her wings. Um, and poetry is particularly significant, um, the author is writing in Persian culture as a way of, um, how does she put it? I come from a culture in which poetry is as much a part of the person as her very heartbeat. Poems are used in celebration and welcoming sorrow and despair, and even in resolving conflicts. For Persians, poetry points to much more than a moment eloquently defined. It is one of the most powerful forms of communication and storytelling. It tells our common story weaved through the resilient and encrypted thread of verse. It has kept our spirit alive despite numerous invasions, 
wars, despotic governments, and sanctions. Um, and then she goes on to talk about the ways in which poetry has kept her family safe, particularly in some of the most harrowing of times. And so for me, ripening, I really liked this one. So that was my Sankofa. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to um, Julia is first up to share her Sankofa and what it means to her. All right, let me just pull that up. Not a problem. Okay. Okay, so for my Sankofa, um, so first, like Dr. Jackson said, um, the meaning that um, we all kind of came in with was that it is not taboo to co collect what has been left behind. Um, after doing a little bit more research um, and kind of trying to figure out what that meant to me, um, I came up with two more definitions that kind of relate to one another. So the first is that we should go back and gather the best of our past. And then the second is that what we have lost or forgotten can be revived or preserved. And so for how Sankofa can be applied in my own life, um, it's in the sense that this past year has been extremely challenging and balancing all the changes that have occurred um, due to the pandemic. And the pandemic has been difficult for everyone um, because there's been a loss of connection. And this has been difficult for me because my family hasn't been able to gather, get together with other family members who we once did before um, because some are unvaccinated or immunocompromised. And this was kind of out of fear of getting someone else sick, those who we loved. Um, my, like I said before, my family is very close, so this was very hard for me to kind of grasp. Um, and I'd like to believe at some point in the future, we will be able to do the things that we once did. So like in the pictures, um, have birthdays, barbecues, dinners. Um, some of the pictures were um, holidays together, um, ski trips. Um, they're all very important in the progression of my family connections. And so the pandemic has kind of caused isolation and this lack of human connection for me. And so when thinking about Sankofa, um, I think that my connection with my family members was lost and kind of left behind. And I believe it's very important for my family and I to start to help each other in the distance ways that we can um, in order to move forward and kind of revive that connection that we once had. Um, I'm hopeful for a greater sense of normalcy in the future, um, but this all got me thinking about some of the ways that this connection can be revived because I was thinking like it's lost, um, but it can be revived in some ways. And so some of those ways um, to stay in touch while still being distanced include using electronics to stay in contact with close friends and family, spending more quality time, um, with those within my household to kind of gain those connections back, the ones that I was missing, and then doing activities outside and having get togethers where the distance can be maintained. And then lastly, keep, keeping up with the communication because I think that's something else that can be lost at times. But that is Definitely. all. Thank you for sharing that, Julia. Um, I think that your Sankofa is one that definitely resonates with a lot of people. Um, yeah, I see a lot of head nods out there. Anyone have any comments or feedback for Julia? Yeah. I liked your photos though, Julia. I mean, are you going to go back home? You'll be home in the summer? Yeah, I will be. Yeah. Yeah, I know this pandemic has been definitely a challenge for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And also helping us all realize what we really value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where our values live. Um, especially with those connections with family. Um, I think we can take that certainly before the pandemic. I know I can speak for myself. Um, uh, being Taking that for uh, granted in, in many ways. I don't live close to my family as well. So um, 
I look forward to being close to them again um, very soon. So, all right. Thank you, Julia. Um, that leaves us next with Kajani. Kajani, please. We'd love to see your, what Sankofa means to you. Hey, good evening, guys. Just making sure everybody is able to see the screen. Okay, Johnny, could you just speak up just a, a little bit? You're just a little bit faint there. Okay. Thank you. Almost immediately after reading the description of Sankova, I was reminded of familial tragedy, curses, and affluence. It brought back memories of my mother, her sisters, her mother, and my great grandmother. It symbolizes their presence in my life. I recall hearing my sister and my girl cousins talk about not wanting to be like their dash our mothers when I was a child. I ain't going to be like mommy when I grow up. I don't want to be like her. I was subsequently said, engaging in such dialogues with my parents, peers, and hearing them agree. I mentioned this to explain that I grew older. As I grew older, I recognized that my mother, her mother, and my great grandmother, like theirs, could only carry us as far as they went. They couldn't take us any farther than they could have seen. I recognized how important their experiences were in my life. In addition, I examined how I made judgments while I was tilting away from options they have previously made. As a result, my re decisions would not have represent their experiences. I quickly understood that in doing so amounted to their determining of my decisions of, for me also. I had to step back and consider how their experience influenced was influenced by social economic factors and how in turn mine had sh been shaped as well. Taking control of my narrative and returning to collect their experience has allowed me to flourish. Looking back, one did not conceal the tools that the next possessed. My mother did not have the tools that I do. And by, com and by combining her experiences and my tools, I can recreate a story that was written for all of us creating a foundation for my kid as she continues to develop her own story and blossom out of the one I've made, ultimately making it better suited for her in the world that she would live in. Um, as you guys can see on the screen, I have a folder collage that I believe depicts my experience of Sankova. When I look at the first photo, I see my sisters, cousins, and I taking in the experiences that would unite us generationally in finding ways to build the foundation that our moms have provided for us. The picture to the right, it depicts a mother instilling something into the child and the child is smiling as she observes the power of knowledge that her mother is transmitting through her. The next photo that I'll look at is the mother the next photo I'll look at is a mother instilling something into her, her child. Is the one of the young girl looking forward to the future while her mother holds her securely and looks aside as her daughter conquers what is ahead. The image with the mother braiding her daughter's hair speaks to me as a black girl. I believe that conversations are simply body language spoken when a mother is doing her daughter's hair is foundational to how a black girl sees herself in society. I come from the Caribbean and the sea is considered and the sea is considered to be very releasing pleasure of bad spirits, etc. The three women standing in the line in the water represents the liberation of gener generational anguish and a strengthened chain of power, especially given how liberated they appear in the image. Another image that I saw that I believe portray my lived experience of Sankova is the one where the women are chanting on the lady who's putting the baton on top of the hill. It simply shows how pleased the women in our family are to see us succeed as they pass on the baton and watch us flourish. At last, the photo of the cheerful woman as they're hugging this person who is morphing into a butterfly, I believe that is going back to the knowledge that you've gained from those around you. And at, we can all see that the women are smiling. And I feel like once we, as people go back to the roots or our family sees us going back to our roots and fighting or conquering the same battles 
that um, have once captivated them makes them happy and smile. And you can see that how we morph into butterflies and fly out of this cocoon that we've once held ourselves in because we are afraid to go back and get what's left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Kajani. That is beautiful. Um, comments, comments or feedback for Kajani. Go ahead, Zakira. Um, I felt like this presentation was very um, representational of Black women in general, of like how we feel and what we need and a great representation of our healing process. Like even starting from just braiding the hair to morphing into a butterfly to like the sea, like all the elements in there really was just like different stages of healing that some black women don't get to, you know, see or get to obtain because of that cocoon you were talking about. Like we just keep ourselves in there because we feel like, you know, we keep ourselves in here. It's, it's a stable thing. And then one day we can get to a butterfly, but like, like you, like you also said about other Black women embracing that person, embracing whatever, you know, trauma they're going through, trying to help them heal. I feel like that's important. And that's what I got from this presentation, the healing process. And in that healing process, you will also need help. It's a village that helps in the healing process. I totally agree. Go ahead, Kajani, sorry. Um, I feel like that is exactly what my presentation represents. Um, it just shows how, like the different stages that you go through when you're going through your Sankova or when I went through when I was going through my Sankova, how like these, um, the village helped me morph into a butterfly. And that's kind of why I explained that picture last. See, so just jump on in there. Oh, okay. I really love that last picture because like um, my mom used to always call, um, call me her beautiful butterfly. And I was like, that is just like, like why I was, I was just thinking about it the other day, looking back at like messages from my mom. And she would always say, you're my beautiful butterfly. Like, because I've been through so many healing processes and like just that picture of the person being hugged and then released into a butterfly that feels I feel like that was like the most powerful image in the presentation as a whole. Thank you for that Z. Um, other comments? Reactions? Mira? I am um, I also think also I love the photos in this like uh just like it just makes like the little black girl in me like just really feel like I don't know it was a great feeling like I got like a visceral response like reaction whenever I saw these photos it just like it feels like black girl joy you know what I mean I um I also feel like it connected really well to like the readings that we were doing about like uh breaking the cycle of like intergenerational trauma like the the coping mechanisms that we saw in uh PTSS by Dr. Roy um I also feel like it connected to uh, uh Dr. Tressie Cotton's uh fix your feet from thick about like um constantly like readjusting yourself to meet other people's expectations and like how we teach that to like each next generation and like uh it's not our fault that that's what our parents like believe that's what we needed to do to like make it through the day and make it through the year but uh I do think that there's like a sort of liberation that comes from confronting that and choosing your own path and I thought your presentation like connected with that really well thank you for that Mira yeah um a lot I mean so much going on there. Uh, I think the cathartic aspect, the warmth, the nurturing. I mean, I, I definitely agree with all of the comments um, and seeing like right Zakira talking about healing. Um, and I think for particularly black women, um, but marginal, marginal people, but particularly, you know, black women um, in this context, uh, you know, how often does sort of nurturing happen? Nurturing goes out, right? But where does that nurturing come in? When I was talking about, the, you know, the way in which we can go beyond woke, we're constantly focusing on someone else, 
um, let's fix someone else, but like, where do we bring that back into ourselves? Where do we nurture um, and caregive? And I, I think that, that you know, th this can apply to a lot of different contexts, but I don't wanna take away um, from the story. Right. Um, and so instead, when, also one of the dangers, right, is when we over deplete ourselves um, or we can't have that healing, nurturing, warmth, that return of that Sankofa, your Sankofa there, Kajani, is that, um, you know, it hardens a person, it, it, you know, and we can see a lot of frustration and sadness and hopelessness and, and anger um, come out because the person is, is in that cocoon, but a little bit, you know, locked in that chrysalis and really just needing to get those wings going and fly out. All righty. Um, thank you, Kajani, for that. Mira, that is now your turn. Okay, so my Sankofa is about, at first, <laughs> I've done this presentation before, and at first what I thought Sankofa was for me was going back to, of course, the way the actual definition of go, it is not shameful to go back and retrieve what was lost. Uh, for me, that was about going back to like our African roots and like seeing how people coexisted with each other before colonization, because all of the all of the isms and all of the phobias were brought forth by colonization like those were brought to us so like uh, the ways that we treat people now didn't have to exist and they didn't exist in previous civilization civilizations before uh in terms of like women in power different gender roles and different expressions the way that we took care of the environment uh, the way that we decided uh, social connections were more important than like profit. Uh, and when I gave this presentation, Dr. Jackson said it wasn't very personal. <laughs> she said it was more like, uh, it was like, it felt like I was reading out of a textbook and I, uh, I see it now. I um Oh, can you guys see my screen? I have no idea what just happened. We can see your screen. You're doing just fine. Go ahead, Mira. Okay, gotcha. Sorry. No worries. I, um, and uh so I thought what it would mean for me to be more personal when it comes to Sankofa. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe this is about liberation. And I, uh, when I got to liberation, I, it still felt like abstract in my mind, like really like metaphorical, philosophical, nothing like truly tangible. Uh, there's just so many socio-political and economic barriers to freedom. And it felt like, is freedom in the mind really enough? And when I asked myself that question, it kind of brought me to, I feel like there's two categorizations of uh, liberation. So there's like structural where we address the socioeconomic and political barriers, uh, things like uh, systemic oppression across all marginalized identities. And it's true, we do need those things, but like waiting, but I also think that waiting for like a big capital R revolution to address white supremacy and patriarchy isn't really enough to let us survive well in the present moment. So I thought maybe the second level, the personal level is what I need to like focus on, even though we need both, maybe the personal level is where liberation can begin. Uh, and I think it's about knowing where you came from is such a strong and rich history is empowering and it gives you hope and it allows you to learn about yourself, allows you to connect with others. And then I realized maybe this is actually about hope, that liberation is actually hope, that liberation and thus Sankofa are hope. Uh, and I think hope is contagious as it should be. Uh, I feel like you were trying to get us all on board with the whole forgiveness thing. And like, I get it in theory. I don't think I'm there yet. I don't know if I will be there anytime soon, but I do think that hope is a beginning to that. Uh, the, the audacity to like fully exist unapologetically without permission as yourself as you are, I think is really powerful. I think it can inspire hope in others. The reason that I picked this photo, it's by Stacy Monday. She called it lost, but when I first saw it, it made me think of like dreaming. And I think I just it just really spoke to me when I thought of it of like dreaming, like how far can I go? Uh, that's the first that's the first impression I got from this photo. So I think for me, Sankofa's hope. Oh, Mira, I'm so proud. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, comments, feedback. Zakira.
Z, we can't hear you. There's an issue with the volume or the sound. You're not muted, so it's- um, Can you okay. hear me now? Yes. Great. Really love the construct of your presentation. From literally going from, because I'm a very logical person, I always tell people this. So when people ask me emotional questions, I just answer logically. And that's exactly what I thought of. Like from going, breaking down your logical boundaries and borders to going down to your like a personal level to where you could understand it. It's the fact that I understood everything, even from like the logical, like breaking it down. I'm like, okay, yeah, I understand. That's why like you saw me like nodding as you were like breaking down the constructs of like logically thinking. But moreover, it, it really makes sense. Like your whole entire presentation, especially the whole thing. Like even me, even like last semester, I could not get past that forgiveness thing. I mean, me and Professor Jackson and the rest of us, we we're like, how are we supposed to forgive? Like, oh my gosh. And it was a crazy example. We we're like, there's no way, you know? But as it as we progress during the class, we start realizing it's more about like yourself. It's more about you relieving that pressure, that stress from yourself like and once you realize that it's within yourself then you can move on and be like you have hope for whomever else for your own future for your own mental health you know for your own like mental stability and happiness so I think hope is a good place to start love your presentation thank you Z Savannah I am um, very similar to what I was going to say. Um, I just want to say I love that. I love that photo and I just love that interpretation of hope. Thank you, Savannah. I'm going to get a little water. Kajani. I, like what Z and Savannah said, like, I really love your presentation because I remember where you were at the beginning and to see you actually like break it down, like it amazed me. Um, and just to see like your picture, I love the image, like that image is so beautiful. I'm going to look for it later because <laughs> it like it spoke so much like and to see how you interpret it um, is just so beautiful. And I understand like um, having like these these limitations um, to your dreams or like ideas and like having to like push that aside and actually gain like like reach in like to the space of like hope or like um I can do this or like just moving away like all the noises and coming to like to the forefront of your own ideas and like believing that you can grasp certain stuff like I love that image and I love the way that you explained your definition of hope and like how you connected to Sankova. Thank you. Thank you, Kajani. Um, let's see, uh, Miara put in the chat, Stacy Monday is the artist. So thank you for that as well. Other comments, other comments or feedback? Go ahead, Simone. Hi, um, I also loved your breakdown, Miara. I really like your categorization. I thought that was wonderful and it flowed like so nicely. Um, I'm wondering though, do you know what are the papers like that are spinning or that are in the air? Like, what is that? I was trying to look at one and then the screen switched. Do you want to do you want to put that back up on screen, Mira? So there's like a map. In, can you guys see the mouse on here? Oh, there's an issue with your sound. Can you try muting and then unmuting again? It's just connecting weird. No. No. It's got a weird, anyways. Um, hmm. Go ahead, though. We'll make do. Sorry. Um, is like louder better or is louder not better? better. Okay. Um, so there's like a. It looks like a piece of a globe, like right in here. So like, a, to me, that's like the lost part. Like, where am I? Where am I going? Uh, these are like. This is just paint and like with the colors in it. Uh, it kind of feels like. The mind is going in different directions. At least that's my interpretation of it. Um, but I, I see, I see a map piece right there. Like, like, where are you? And then this is kind of like the different directions you're being pulled in. At least that was my interpretation. 
Thank you for going back, even though it, it made you have to go through that. But yeah, that um, great presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. That was good. Um, and I think, you know, this idea, um, it's Archbishop Desmond Tutu who says there can be no future without forgiveness, right? And I think it does tie, you know, hope. Um, hope is part of, right, believing that there's, that something can be different in the future, that it isn't always going to be like it has been. That hope, it, part of hope is change right? That things can be different. Um, but the truth is, again, the world is the world and the world has been the world throughout time and people have been dealing with the same challenges and struggles um, in different forms. And so if we're waiting for the day in which conflict will cease to exist, before we can be happy, before we can have joy, um, then we will find ourselves spending a lot of time very unhappy. That what we can always change, right, is ourselves, is deciding um, to find happiness and joy, to find it internally for ourselves, right? Um, instead of waiting for that external um, to suddenly manifest itself, like, oh, it's all gonna be like a calm sea. And, and there are moments in time, but nothing is static. Um, I have a, Another comment here in the chat, Mira, uh, nope, it's a, uh, Z says, it reminds me that the mind is not grounded. Uh, it's meant to be free. Okay, and that's referring to the image. Um, Mira says, I really like that. So uh, dreaming, you know, this is another concept we've talked a lot about, consciousness. Um, the whole idea of going beyond woke right? Reality is created in the mind. Um, social constructs, everything is a, a construct. It's not, it has no meaning without our attachment to it. Um, and so when you can have hope, then you can dream a new dream and then reality can begin to change. And that's what a little, right? Saying hope is going back. Go ahead, Mira. Thanks, Susan, here, here, put that in the chat. It kind of I makes me think of Maybe loss was like, I was thinking of it with the wrong connotation. Uh, like, I feel more like the weightlessness the longer I, that I look at this photo. Like, a, like the concept of like the mind being free. Um, I can't remember what this is. But like, I like this better. Like, this idea of like, being free. Like, it feels like being weightless. Not like the longer I look at it. Like, the pieces going in different directions aren't like, like going astray. They're just like, like they're floating. They're free. They're going in their own direction. They're not on the right track, but like they're on their own track, which kind of, that kind of feels like liberation. That kind of feels like hopeful. Absolutely, Mira. And I love that word liberation. Like there's a word to hold on to, liberation. Um, Zakira. I like the word weightless because as a black woman, there's a lot of weight to carry around. That word strong, it carries so much weight. So to hear weightless and free, like not grounded, you know, just, you know, just being free, like those type of words associated with the black woman, it feels nice. It's like, I feel weightless now. Okay. I feel free just by hearing this presentation about just like by being here and absorbing all of this positive energy, this, I don't know, will to be free, this order to be free. It feels like a order to be free. That's how it feels. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, well said. I mean, that heaviness, um, when we take on more than, you know, the world's problems, again, trying to mop up the ocean. Um, yeah, right. To be able to dream, to be able to relax, to be able to breathe, you know, along with the angry black woman, trope there's also the strong black woman um but everyone's human right and and sometimes even you know i'll be the first to admit i you know have picked up more than my share and had to learn you know that this is taking a toll on my own personal well-being right like how do i be free 
How do I liberate myself? Um, and then when you're liberated and free, what's the beautiful thing that then you really are of service to others, right? Then you can come with your smile. Then you can come with your ideas and dreams instead of with this kind of heaviness, this, this I'm carrying the weight of the world. Um, and, you know, we can certainly understand how we get there history will tell us how we got there. Um, but the thing is, at some point, circumstances may have changed, but we didn't notice. We didn't notice. Um, and so the liberation component is really needing to liberate, to, to decide to liberate ourselves. We're waiting for the hero to come or the, the revolution, right? I mean, we can all hope for revolutionary change. We work towards it. It's not just hoping. Hope begins it, right? Hope is that seed, those seeds that get dispersed in that, that Rumi poem. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you've got to take care of yourself, do that nurturing work, that healing work, that, that caregiving work, and then you can really get in there. Um, and you can also work with others right? So that you aren't lifting that load by yourself. Um, being able to build those collaborations across groups that, you know, historically we haven't worked well with. Um, but there's, a, there's a, an opening that also opens up and then more possibilities. Go ahead, Mira. I just have one last question. Like in your personal opinion, do you think that hope has to come first before structural change or structural change is what allows us hope. Um, your sound is still a little tweaked out. So um, no, don't worry about it. But I think if I heard that right, do I think that hope comes first then structural change or structural change then hope? 100%, I would say hope has to come first because we can change the structure, but when the structures are now internalized, it doesn't matter that things have changed. And we know that. We know that because even though we've done a lot of structural changes in society, we still reproduce the social arrangements. Um, and that's on a meta, a meta scale. You can see that in your own lives. You can um, find yourself in fact, that's how socialization works, right? Like this idea that you internalize the rules of the system, whether that system or your family, whatever experiences you have, right? They imprint themselves deep within your psyche and then your subconscious picks them up and you're playing them out without ever becoming kind of woke to what's happening. Um, and so you have to do that sort of critical, Right, that, that's why a critical lens is so important, but we have to do it on ourselves as well, because even when we're in better circumstances, we can't appreciate them because we're conditioned, right? There's a conditioning that goes on. And this is not to say that material inequality isn't real. It's very real. And it's a very dire situation for many people. Um, but uh, how we work through, I mean, when we're seeing everything in sort of this blanketed dire situation and we're not taking advantage of opportunities and openings. Um, and, and particularly for, for a lot of middle-class people, we're not sitting in dire circumstances. In fact, um, barriers to social action um, are very low today as they were historically. And yet we saw people taking huge risks with their well-being to try to fight for workplace um, equality, gender equality, racial equality, um, uprisings. You know, the whole Underground Railroad came with quite a stiff penalty. Um, and today we find ourselves trapped, right, in our conditions. And, and a lot of those are those conditions of the mind, um, our beliefs, our, be our ideologies. So definitely, um, of course, it's a both and. We want to change the structure. We want to change those material circumstances and conditions. Um, but you can see people who have come up like poverty is a good one. People who grew up in poverty who still have fear of scarcity, you know, spend their whole lives hoarding, never have enough, um, can never have enough money, can never have enough, you know, power, power, money, it's all together, are always afraid. Um, and it's, it's not, her circumstances are quite, probably living quite a lot of comfort 
um, for generations, but it's, it's living, they, they're trapped. They've lost their ability to see their way out. So, um, Kajani, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, mirror, mirror question just reminded me of like this experience or mental battle that I went through today. Um, it's kind of, um, watching, um, Ketan Ketanji Brown Jackson, um, through her nomination process, um, to Supreme Court judge, um, watching her interviews or question and answers with the senators, it reminds me, um, it just made me so excited, like, to see her, like, continue to fight, um, through this nomination process, no matter how, like, dirty or, like, murky it gets, and it made me feel so happy as a little Black girl who, like, one day, like, one of my main goals is to become a judge, make me feel so happy, it gives me so much hope, and then I sat, and, and I was just, like, would I be like, would I even think of ever becoming a Supreme Court judge before like she um, was on the forefront, a black woman was on the forefront of this, a black woman with a very ethnic name that a lot of people like um, mispronounce is like, was that ever gonna be one of my goals? Would I have this exciting feeling? Would I hope to be that ever one day before I seen her? And it just, mere question just like, rem like ignited that again in me. Um, and the way that she questioned it was perfect. Like now I have to like question myself, like is structural change come first or does hope come first? And like your response also helped me like through answering it. I'm not sure which one, but I know that structural change definitely helps um, see or puts you in a position to get hope or gain hope. Excellent point there. Excellent point. Z, go ahead. I feel like, as um, I just want to answer the question from my perspective. I feel like even before you saw her, even before you thought of a future of structural change, you had to have some type of hope to even want structural change. Like you hope for something, you hope for an idea, you hope for a future. And even if that future isn't in sight, it starts with hope, even when we were going through civil rights, marching for women's rights, marching for whatever reason, every, at one point we all thought that it wasn't gonna be something that would be attainable, but it all started with hope. And I'm thinking about my own personal circumstances. Like, I'm like, uh, I want stability, but like, I'll have hope and happiness and all this other stuff later, but it has to start somewhere. And I always thought that, okay, it'll start with some type of structure in my life. That's where to start. And then that's when I'll have hope and happiness and all this other stuff. But in reality, it has to start within yourself, within your heart, within something that you believe in. So I feel like it has to start with hope first to ignite something into someone. Like, like how Kajani said that it, ignited something in her to see um, um, a black woman be go through this process to become a judge and it ignited something in her um, to hear this presentation and that something is the hope I feel that was already there deep down inside that's how I feel. yes Z definitely um, hope is that spark right? That little flame inside of us that says, keep trying. Um, DJ says uh, I, in the chat, I feel like hope drives people to work harder. DJ, do you want to say something about that? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, no, but um, when I first heard the question, uh, I kind of posed the question in my head, without hope, uh, what are you working towards? Like, uh, just thinking about it personally, like if I uh, didn't, like kind of like belief, I guess, that's kind of synonymous to hope. If you don't believe in something, then what would force you to work towards it? So uh, going back to the question, uh, just, I wouldn't even think about the structural change if I didn't hope for it first. Thank you, DJ. Yeah. Why, why get up in the morning without hope? 
And hope isn't really even always about us, although it's what gives us fuel, but certainly we all were someone's hope. Right, that's how we got here. Our ancestors had a dream and we became that dream. And we need to keep dreaming. Um, I've got a couple comments in the chat and then I wanna make a, an announcement. We're gonna go a little bit longer if that's okay to the class. Um, we have a lot of Sankofas to go through. Um, so I'm gonna give us a break. Uh, but in the chat, um, Miera says, Zikira, you never miss. Z says back to Mira, to, to I thank you. Love the question. And DJ, yes, um, in agreement. All right. Um, so normally we go one hour. We're going to continue this recording a bit longer um, because we have a number of Sankofas to get through tonight. We'll have some more for next week. Also, when we talk about 13. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording um, and then we'll come back. Um, but normally we will just be within an, an hour time frame. So, all, all right, right guys, so uh, we are back from our break. Uh, so uh, next up is Tahia, who is going to tell us about her Sankofa. Tahia, we look forward to hearing from you. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up real quick. All right, so um, this is kind of my Sankofa reflection. So um, the way I interpreted Sankofa was that um, Sankofa means to me um, about the reflection of the past being harmless and using it forward into the future to demonstrate progression. And um, the way that this is kind of applied to me, I kind of broke it into like three sections. So like a challenge, a choice and an outcome. So kind of my challenge um, basically is that um, I grew up in a South Asian family um, who was pretty conservative about um, culture and religion. So I was kind of pretty much forced to stay within my communities because um, we were told kind of as we were young to just never astray from our community because it was um, interpreted as shameful. Um, so, of course, as I was kind of just growing up, I kind of got tired of being in like a constricted bubble of space, and I just kind of wanted an answer to everything. Um, so I kind of just learned to begin more about what life and what religion and my culture meant to me. And um, as I grew up, I many of the ideologies I kind of just encountered um, and forced to learn growing up they were so contradictory to me that as someone who just wanted to understand everything at once, um, it just became difficult to en embrace the independent world, just trying to be independent. So this kind of made me realize that a lot of the previous generations in my community and culture have embraced both culture and religion, um, not only old fashioned, but kind of just mixed to make one story. And so that tie of just learning how to distinguish religion and culture um there i had to realize that there are two different stories and two different histories that just made me open my eyes to a lot of contradictory facts that i just want to believe that were true so this comes to my choice part of it where um I'm just trying to learn everything, beginning to learn that um, like everything in the world, there are negative aspects of the world. And as much as I want the world to be a peaceful place without conflict, sadly, that's kind of not true. So um, this kind of became difficult to me because my religion and culture was portrayed in a negative light due to like social media. And um, in addition to that, it's just been very hard to you know, be outward as a lot of the choices I had, you know, had to be secluded. So um, my community growing up uh, never really brought up um, topics like taboo topics. Um, and, you know, even worse, it kind of just felt like it wasn't important um, because, you know, my community believed that some things were just, there were far worse things in life than what I wanted to know about. And so because of this, I watched a lot of people in my community, you know, a lot of friends of my, you know, culture kind of just 
you know, alienate themselves and they just kind of started rebelling because of the belief that being a South Asian American um, meant that they wouldn't be able to express themselves the way they wanted to. Um, so as someone who liked reading books, um, I just wanted to learn to find something different. And this time I kind of just wanted to learn how can I be active in speaking up about the disparity between my culture and my religion and kind of just using that time to express who I am in the modern society that I live in today and how I could just create my own story. So um, when I got to college and, you know, I just began to talk to others and I just formed a support group. Um, social media was also really helpful because um, it was able to give me other perspectives and learn that I wasn't the only one who was felt like this. I've met a lot of relatable people in my life. And then I was able to kind of just take action from there. So I just started doing things that were out of norm. And I joined a lot of groups, made many friends who were different from me, and just kept my mind to open to anything and everything, um, while also trying to maintain my belief and reminder to remember where I stood in my independence. So the outcome part is pretty challenging for the most part. I think for me, it was the most challenging because um, the first thing I felt when I kind of began to grow independent was a lot of criticism and judgment um, because a lot of people were kind of worried what would it do to my reputation and things like that. But I kind of just saw that as a way of growth rather than a way of negative negativity and fear. So growing from that, I started going to activist groups. I just wanted to break a stigma that a person's diversity is just as important as their identity. And it also gave me the confidence and the hope to be a generational advocate, you know, to stop intergenerational trauma and just speak up about my differences through different um, organizations and just through different people around, you know, Stetson. So making new friends, embracing college life, I realized that like, even though my story is different from someone else, it doesn't mean that it's bad or less than another. So for me, the reason why the definition of Sankofa is so important to me is because it not only continues to inspire me to keep growing from my past and telling myself not to put the down the pen down on my story, but even more so is that I have a lot of chapters in my life to create because I feel like this is only the beginning of a book and not the end of a book. So thank you. Thank you for that, Tahia. That's beautiful. I love the ending of that, right? Just the beginning of a book. Um, but you've done so much growth, right? Definitely. I love that. I love that way to kind of make sense of it all. Comments and feedback for um, Tahia. Go ahead, Mira. It's like a couple real quick things. Uh, I thought that the presentation itself was like really cool. Like how you deliver it sounded like really nice. This sounds weird. Uh, I just really liked the way you presented it. It sounded really well. Like it flowed really well. Also, it looked really pretty. Like the colors you used in the slides, the backdrop with all that was really pretty. Uh, what really resonated with me was like the outcome slide with uh, the judgment, uh, the judgment part. Cause I feel like there's this immense pressure on people like on POC communities and like any marginalized identity. Uh, where like you feel like afraid or like nervous to criticize the problems in your own community because then it kind of makes you look bad to the dominant culture like uh, I'm thinking about in black culture where it's like you don't really talk about as women you don't really talk about intimate partner uh, intimate partner violence because like oh we can't have more problems put on display we're already dealing with enough so like you kind of like hide that part but like it is something that needs to be addressed so like when it comes to criticizing things that are like not that great about your culture, like in like aspect of religion, like I just that resonated with me. I feel like it's important. It's scary, but it's important. And I, uh, I don't know, that just I felt that. Thank you, Mira. Other comments? Yeah, um, I think. Oh, go ahead, Z. I feel like the point in the project. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I like the fact that she was able to talk about a problem that she was having within, you know, her, her own community. And then in the end, it was all about growth, growth within herself, 
growth that growth just within the situation I feel like that is something that I struggle with just as Mira was talking about um learning to pick out the flaws within yourself and within your community without feeling like you are the villain you know because you're noticing these problems and trying to resolve them you know it can be hard especially when you're comparing you know your life and your problems to um you know uh, other people and you know other counterparts it can be hard especially me I try to pride myself on being strong and then you know mental health issues and it's like we're already dealing with enough like we can't be dealing with mental health issues as well but we really need to tackle mental health issues especially in the uh, black community so that we can grow and that's what I got out of this presentation definitely uh, realizing what the problem is and realizing that it can be fixed through growth Thank you, Z. I appreciate that comment as well. Um, other other comments? Mira uh, adds in the chat. Um, reminds me of weight, weight and weightlessness. Do you want to um, clarify that? Just um, what we were talking about before the break about like uh, women, uh, black women specifically carrying so much weight on them all the time because of like the expectation that we have to be strong, but like also fighting all the other stereotypes that we have against us. Uh, just like, I don't know. It's just like extra baggage that we can take off. Like, you know, if that makes sense, like uh, allow to, like, I feel like we take this extra baggage of like, oh, I can't deal with this because I'm already dealing with this stuff. So if you push it to the side, but really you're just putting more weight on your shoulders that you have to deal with eventually. That's just what it reminded me of. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Go ahead, Z. Oh, just want to talk about um, oh, the weight. Uh, basically, how can we grow? How can we become this butterfly if there's so much weight? There's weight that you know, our counterparts are putting on us, like, you know, stereotypical white racism, all the other stuff, but also the weight that we're putting on ourselves and people in our community. So how can we become this butterfly if, if this cocoon is filled with so many things that need to be solved that sometimes it's embarrassing. So we hide in that cocoon and we will never become a butterfly because it's kind of embarrassing and hard to talk about. So that's even more weight that keeps us in that cocoon then we cannot grow because of embarrassment and even like just fear fear of how other people is going to see our problems fear of how we may see them like i don't know and that's why i feel like growth is important to realize that growth is more important than that fear that is the solution to fear which is growth Thank you, Z. Um, we should all keep in mind sometimes growth comes with some growing pains, right? Just like when we're developing. Um, and it's that fear of maybe the pain. And sometimes we can imagine it worse. Um, I think, to Tahia, you really capture, um, I think, visually as well as in your own words, um, the control that our structures, our communities, our families, uh, can impose on us and trying to move outside of that, we worry about the judgment, right? What would happen um, being judged by others? And that and that's true for, you know, um, the way in which we see ourselves and we become overly critical for the choices that we want to make, right? Being true to ourselves, but then the compromise of that, right? what, who are we comprom We're compromising our own integrity we're compromising our own self-worth um, and we're compromising our own happiness. And so really breaking out of those relations, you know, not, not, you're not really breaking out of those relationships though, right? Like Tahia, how does your family, how do they, are, they're comfortable now. They probably weren't comfortable, but now, or your community, how, how has that been? Has, has your family been okay? Has there been an adjustment period? So um, I can't say for, I can't really speak for my community in general, but at least 
within my family, there has been a lot of acceptance. It has been hard. I'm not going to lie. But as um, as I've just kind of been talking with them and just having these conversations, I've, you know, learn to like see both of their sides so it's like while they've seen my side I've also seen a lot of their side too so it's just been pretty harmonious lately and I think um it's like I never realized that like I was going like even though I was growing like they were also on the other side they were growing too um so it was like my family was all we were all just growing at the same time and it's actually pretty wonderful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, and I think we forget, right? We're in relationship. So really one side of the coin, if one side of that relationship changes, the other side is definitely going to respond to it one way or another, We're going to feel that. And, um, you know, and also trust that our relationships uh, can handle can handle changes and um, and growth and and go through some of those turbulent times. Um, I think the fear is around thinking that relationships aren't as strong as you know the bonds, the um, you know if you will the love right between each other, our um, compassion and and care and concern and. Um, kindness, right, if you will, between each other is stronger than um, our differences. Um, but I think what can happen when we don't uh, live our truth, then when we finally do step into it, it can be quite, um, you know, it can be quite challenging, right, and disruptive. But, um, you know, uh, it's a process. It's a back and forth. So thank you, Tahia. Um, I appreciate you sharing. Um, any other additional comments or questions here before we move on to the next Sankofa? All right. So um, that takes us to Yasmin. Can you see my screen? We sure can. Okay. Um, when I think of Sankofa, what comes to mind is that everyone creates their own path. And everybody has their own story. So you can't let what happens in somebody else's past affect your future. And when I say someone, I mean people's parents. And in particular, not speaking for everybody, but in my own family, I know the opportunities that my parents have given my siblings, as you can see in the picture, well, this is me and my younger siblings, the opportunities that were given to me and my older siblings as well, but they just happen so not to take advantage of them. Um, a lot of people, parents, they try to live their unliving dreams through their kids, and they don't really think about how that can really affect them down the road. And I always like tell my parents, like they always compare what I do in life to what my siblings do. Like, oh, y'all should look up to what Yaz is doing. Y'all should wanna go to college. And I always have to sit down with them and tell them what I do, they might not want. I want to go to school. School isn't for everybody. And it's just a conversation that it took for me when I got out of high school to sit down with my parents and let them know what my younger brother might want is not the same thing as I want. What my other brothers did when they were growing up and they're older than me, I didn't want to do that. I picked my own path. I'm living my own story. My sister, she's going to pick her own path. She's going to live her own story. And so is my brother. And I try to explain that a lot to my older brother, not older brother, my younger, but the one in the red and black pants. I always try to tell him, especially because he's going into college, just because what I'm doing in college, you don't have to go. They always push him towards, you should go to the same school as your sister. He might not want to go to this school. He's not me. We're not living the same dream. I'm going to school for law. He wants to have his own business. That's two completely different things. And I just feel that you can't try to please everybody through your life. You have to do what's best for you. That's it. Thank you, Yasmin. Yeah, you gotta be, I mean, this very much, right, echoes on Tahia's, um, just like kind of a nice tie-in in the sense of really being authentic and true to who you are. Um, Z, go ahead. 
Um, just speaking from experience, I also have that same problem um, because I am also going to school for law and I have like a hundred siblings. So my family is literally always comparing everyone to me and they don't realize that that's also putting a lot of pressure on me. And I'm pretty sure it puts a lot of pressure on you that everyone is always comparing other siblings to you. So then you feel like, I, me personally, I feel like I can't fail. That like, back to the weight. That like, what about the room for me to grow as a person? Like, I don't feel like I could grow as a person because I am now this example for so many people and I do come from a low-income family and I'm first generation college student so it's a it's a lot of pressure when people are comparing to your other siblings especially siblings it's different because you feel it and they also feel it and they probably feel it even more and it can cause some tension between siblings that the that the parents have created and you you know, you you have no say so over that. So I've also experienced that as well. What I find it's comforting is um, letting your siblings know that they are their own beings. Like I, my little brother is actually about to go. He's about to go to college, and um, a lot of people are saying he should go to the military. He's a major in business, but he's a wonderful artist. Like I have paintings that he has painted me and I told him he needs to go and do what makes him happy. So he's gonna be an art major now. And it's like, we're changing the, the dynamic of our family. We, we're, not lo- we're no longer living for, we're not in survival mode. We're, we're trying to do things that make us happy, which is the one thing that's kind of hard to present to your family when you're trying to go into college and you're trying to create a career for yourself, especially when you come from a low income family, especially when you're a first generation college student, you know, people associate college with stability with some type of corporate job instead of what makes you happy. So I totally agree. Well put Z. I think that particularly that piece on survivor or survival mode or survivor mode, um, that is a, a piece of, um, right? History that can get passed down that was necessary for a moment in time, but that's a good example of something that isn't existing anymore, but we're still operating under. So um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and first um, let Yasmin, since this is her Sankova, and then I'll come around to Mira and Tahia. Yasmin, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that I totally agree with what Z was saying about how it puts pressure on yourself that you feel like, oh, I have to stick to what I'm doing just because I'm being compared to so many people and um, they're looking at me like all eyes are on me, like my aunts, my uncles, my mom, my dad, my siblings, older siblings, younger siblings, cousins, older cousins, like they're all looking at me like, oh yes, you got to stick it through. And I'm like, what if I just, I could could wake up one morning and just like, I don't want to be in college no more. And it's like, but I feel as if I have to stick it through just because I am the first one to go to college. So it's like, oh, you got to do it for everybody, not just yourself. Exactly. But then like, right. But then it kind of piggybacks to what Z saying about your joy. Right. Yeah. Very good. Very good connections. Mira and then Tahia. Um. All of that. I agree with absolutely all of that. Absolutely. A thousand percent. Also, I feel like growth doesn't need to be linear. I feel like there's this, like, a uh, like failing is a part of growth and failing doesn't always have to be bad. And I feel like as members of marginalized identities, we carry not just the weight of our stereotypes, but like the weights of our entire communities on our back. Like, uh, the same way that we're like representatives of the culture like when there's like of our entire culture, like in the eyes of the dominant group, because there's so specific, there's so little representation of us in uh, the, in the, like the, the things that the dominant group like pushes as like the things that you need to achieve uh, that when we're the only ones doing it, there's so much pressure from everybody. There's the eyes of the dominant culture on you. There's the eyes of your community on you. It's almost like the livelihood of the community is like put on your shoulders. It's just a lot of weight. It's, almost unbearable. And I feel like this expectation for growth to be linear and perfect is just 
not fair. <laughs> it's an unbearable weight that we shouldn't have to bear. And unrealistic, right? It's also very unrealistic. It's an ideal that we can't live up to. And then we internalize that. So how do we reclaim, right? Thinking of ideological, um, you know, that hope, uh, hope can go away when you're trying to achieve the impossible. And certainly that's not to say we can't imagine what has never happened before, but when we set up uh, a goal that isn't really attainable, um, it leaves a, a level of frustration. So very good on that and, and can give you that heaviness and bye-bye joy. And there goes creativity and the whole point for living. Um, to hear. So um, Yasmin's presentation really resonated with me a lot. It really was relatable, um, especially because I'm the oldest. I have a younger sister and, you know, I feel like this, you know, can come like relate for like all people who are like the oldest of all their siblings were like, um, when you as like as you grow and then as you just you know try to figure yourself out you're also like automatically put into this like role model situation where you, you know that pressure of being a role model being um a perfectionist it just kind of has to come and um, within you you know and it's like you have to try to do everything to kind of just bring your you know achievements up at the same time like hide your flaws and it, it can get really overwhelming sometimes um i mean i've as the oldest, again, I've personally experienced that many times. And then I remember like going to college and once I was trying to like figure out, you know, what I wanted to do and stuff. And once I had like was happy with what I was doing, um, I know my younger sister who was like, you know, about to, you know, start applying for college and this stuff. Um, my parents are kind of like forcing her to kind of go the same path that I was taking. And I had to tell them that, um, that, uh, while it is would be nice you know for her to take the same path as me um it might not be in her suit it might you know and that's when I had to learn that like and show my parents that success can mean a different thing to anyone um and it's because growing up a lot of people when they see when they hear success they hear like what makes the most money what makes the most desirable to their community what makes the most reputation and so it's you know having to teach my parents and a lot of my community that success can actually mean something that's completely different than that. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the biggest takeaways I took from this presentation. Thank you, Tahia. Um, I'm going to uh, get to Z's comment in just a minute, but I wanted to also add on also as the oldest in my family, um, I certainly that resonates very much so um, having to set the standard and that bar and, um, and really having spent the vast majority I mean, I've done some little bit of soul searching over this last year, uh, the pandemic certainly shifts, I think a lot of us to think about, you know, beginning right off with Julia's presentation, um, thinking about family values and all of these kinds of things, but redef redefinitions of success, like, and, and realizing, you know, uh, I have a lot of things in my life that people would say are quite successful, right? A law degree, a PhD in sociology, postdoc from, yeah, like I have lots of, lots of accomplishments and yet, um, you know, uh, a lot of them are good on paper, but don't necessarily satisfy my soul. Right. And, um, and we can get into those, um, uh, patterns, right. That get inherited, um, either from society or our families or communities. Um, well, this is what successful people do. Even particularly what's interesting is a lot of times in our own families, no one was those things, their ideals, ideals that were grabbed and then sold and fed to us like well I see that person over there successful and that person's a doctor that person's a lawyer that person is you know rich you know financial wealthy so therefore um they must be happy they have their needs met and again that that survivor mode um but never really asking that question like are they satisfied are they satisfied in their lives? Are they joyful in their lives? Do their lives have meaning? Um, and so it's great that you guys are asking those questions. Um, I've got Z and Kajani's hands up. So I'll do Z first, then Kajani. Uh, oh, and I will say, um, yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So just to start, um, I've lost my train of thought because you were talking and I was like, yeah, like that's it. Okay. 
Starting from what you said, I've been thinking a lot about what looks good on paper. Like I'm going, thinking about going to law school, things of that sort, you know, and I've always been a good on paper type of person, even to my friends. Kajani is my friend and I literally talk about what I look like on paper, you know, what my future husband may look like on paper or whatever, what my life may look like on paper. But it's like, now that I've experienced a lot of grief and a lot of like transformative feelings, it's like, I cannot perform at that level, that A level, like that A plus stellar level. And uh, I'm now taking a gap year, something I never thought I'd ever do to pursue, you know, my grieving process to, you know, come out of that cocoon. And that's something that I never thought that I would do. And all my family's looking like, like, don't take a gap year, whatever. And everyone's looking at me like, what, what is going on? But outside of what looks good on paper, like, I feel like there's a good balance. I feel like I still look good on paper because I've acquired a job at a law firm before I graduated, you know, working and working. So, hey, and then I get to find myself. I get to have a paid vacation. I get to do things and figure out what else am I going back to San Kofa? What else going back to who I used to be like that creative unit. Like I used to like to write poems, drink cucumber water and meditate every morning. I haven't drunk cucumber water and meditated in three years. You know, it's time to get back to ourselves. We can still be scholars. We can still be, you know, successful black women, successful black people, successful people and get back to our like peaceful original selves. Like that is what I'm doing. So I really don't care about what anybody else thinks at this point, because I'm going back to my original self. I'm going back to the person that the creator wanted me to be. And that's a spiritually sound person. I love that, Z. And I think that's very inspirational for so many. Um, Simone says in the chat, it's like, you are preserving what you see might be at risk of being left behind in yourself by taking this time to go back. TJ says inspirational. I would totally agree. And it totally resonates with me, Z, in so many ways you can't imagine. Um, but it's a return to that time of innocence. You know, you see all of this um, all of these people doing inner child work, right? Like, you know, especially as people get older, even younger, right? Like turn to your inner child and what are we looking for in our inner child, right? Is that innocence, that wonder when we were little, you know, kids that just life is like amazing. Like the world is an amazing place with wonderful experiences. And as we move through, we're conditioned and taught and, you know, to, to fear it, to shut down, um, to deny, to deny our desires, to deny our dreams. And those dreams aren't good dreams. Those dreams don't make money or those dreams don't, those aren't realistic dreams. Um, so we put on, you know, other people's clothes, write other people's words, think other people's ideas. And then we at some point have to say, I'm not, this isn't me. Like, where am I? And Zisa, it sounds like you're doing a good thing for yourself by taking that gap year. Definitely. Um, so good for you for being brave enough to stand up for yourself. Um, Kajani. Um, the perspective that I was going to bring is quite different than the, that you guys have mentioned. Um, I am the younger sibling of like eight and all my siblings have already gone into the world and like forged their own path and then is living. They found their way. And now it's my turn. And I just feel like, cause they poured so much love and inspiration into me or like they've wait, they've been waiting forever because like there's gaps between our age. And now that they're seeing me like um, this, this wonderful or how they look at me this wonderful young girl like coming into society they expect so much of me and like they expect my path to be clean like um because their path had so much um bumps in the road and though like some of those bumps are removed for me I I try to explain to them like continuously like it's not as easy as you guys try to make it seem it is and 
um, because um, my mom was absent in their process or transitioning um, and she's like very present in mine because I'm her last. And I'm trying to tell like, she's learning as I'm learning, as they're learning um, that, that life, we all have different paths in life and um, all our different paths um, teaches us something new. And I feel like with me going about life, how I am and trying to live like, as like consciously, like I'm always trying to live consciously because before I'm never like present in the moment you know and I'm like I feel like the way that I'm living is teaching all of us just like how to live consciously and have our own paths in um our own paths in life and just how to move thoroughly and just watch each other instead of um going like comparing making comparisons of um out of our lives but um, rather like watching us flourish individually and turning into our own person because it's so hard when like there's just so many eyes on you and so much pre like the pressure of like society and things of that sort. Absolutely, Kajani. Absolutely. Um, understanding everyone's growing. I think that's key. Like your mother is growing. I think um you know, we don't have enough space for growth really that came out in like, you know, this word that came out in Tahia's um, presentation, but um, growth opportunities for ourselves and for those people around us to grow, um, particularly people who are sitting in positions of power. Hmm? Um, do we allow, you know, it's sort of, we we hold people fixed. And this is the issue with forgiveness because it doesn't allow, if you hold people to the harm they've caused you, you're freezing yourself and you're freezing them in a kind of um, narrative. And it, it doesn't allow for growth. It just doesn't, there's no place to move. There's no, that's why Archbishop Desmond Tutu says there can be no, no growth um, or no future without forgiveness. Um, Z, I see your hand up, but I do see a comment in the chat I wanna respond to. DJ says, um, that he really found your uh, story there, um, Z, very inspirational after his personal tragedy. Um, DJ, do you want to say a little bit more? I just want to give you an opportunity. You don't have to, but certainly if you'd like to add to that. Um, no, uh, I'll keep it short. It was just at the time when I came in this, so um, talking about the experience. So I have a twin sister. So me and her, we went into college together, obviously. So um, just when everything happened, both of us kind of want to just stop and pause, but it was looked down upon in our family. So we kind of felt like we had to keep going. And just hearing Z talk about how she is taking this gap year is something that I wasn't even strong enough to even think about doing. Because at the time I wanted to, but everybody around me was like, no, you got to keep going. Da, 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 da. I just, I, and now I'm kind of like pushing my way through. If anything, I, I've tried to expedite the process just to get it over with. So I feel like if I could go back, I would channel some of that, you know, just her strength to be like, I'm taking care of myself, basically. Absolutely, DJ, right? Knowing when to say, I need a break knowing when to say, I'm not going to keep pushing. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to act like my life hasn't just, you know, the grieving process that Z talked about going through, um, like needing permission for that. And then there's this conversation about being in the now, right? So where, what happened to your present moment, TJ, when you're talking about like, I'm just going to, and I see so many students do this, right? Like, I'll, in advising, they're trying to fast track their way through, right? Oh, I'm taking, you know, five classes. I just want to get through this. Just want to get through this. Then you kind of miss most of what this is. This is your life. This is your life. We're waiting to live life for someday. Where is someday? You know, um, and then even if you make it to someday, you're fried, you're burned out, you're stressed out, you're, you know, um, depressed, angry, all the things I talked about, where did the joy go? Where did your life go? Where did the time go? Right. So, um, it's good to kind of have these reflection points and times to teach each other 
and to make space and, and give permission. So thank you, DJ, for sharing that. I think that helps a lot of us and Z as well. Z, go ahead. Um, just to go back to what uh, Kajani was talking about, like I said, you have a lot of siblings. So I resonate with that and I am the youngest. <laughs> so <laughs> um, a lot of my older siblings in have a lot of envy and a lot of hate towards me and even my mother who's now gone because they feel like she spent a lot more time with me but the truth is she was just learning you know and I was learning things from her and she was learning things from me you know and it becomes a thing where people have to realize that I my mom had kids when she were older she was younger so they're like 30 years old and I'm like 20 something don't want to out myself anyways <laughs> so like that's a gap like her learning so learning process and people become different people like kids change people D like different personalities in a child changes people and moreover going back to DJ I want to say that I am still going through that process of pushing through I am a senior I have we have less than what 40 days left and I am tired. I am drained. I feel you pushing through. I am taking six classes. One of those I dropped to have an internship. Um, so I could breathe. I'm taking my paralegal classes. I'm working full time. I have a part time job. Like it is a lot for people to keep telling you to push through when they couldn't do what you're doing now. That's what you sit there and tell yourself. Like you sit there and be like, can you do what I'm doing now? It takes a lot of strength to even take one class and deal with that type of trauma that you're experiencing. So I just decided that I'm gonna give it this last push. This last push, I'm gonna give it all I got. You know, today's 50%. Someone told me it's the best 100% out of that 50%. If it's two percent, it's the best hundred percent out of the two percent, and that is how I'm getting through it. For the last past week, you guys haven't seen me in class, and that's just because I've been going through a lot mentally, and I'm finally coming out. So it's just that cocoon was weighing me down, you know. And now I'm trying to sprout and drink cucumber water and meditate. So that's where I am. Thank you for that, Z. Absolutely. Good for you. Um, Kajani says in the uh, chat, consciously living, that was, is my new year's resolution living in tomorrow. Today is such a thief of life and joy. Well said. Um, Mira, uh, I'll go ahead and take your comment and then we'll switch off to Savannah. Go ahead, Mira. Just really quickly what Zagira was talking about. Um, it just reminded me of like the, of what Simone Biles was going through the year before, uh, where like we just expect a lot out of specifically black women to like push through things and to like deliver. But like it just, I feel like it speaks to a larger image of like the way dominant cultures like to look at marginalized cultures as like something to consume, something that they can do for them. And I feel like that's something that internally we not internally that we tend to like internalize in our own communities where we expect us to push through it and push through it and keep pushing through it so that we can consume this like in a way if that I'm not, I'm not sure if that makes sense if I'm saying what I want to say but like there's this expectation for you to get through your hard stuff so that I can enjoy it if that makes sense like there's I feel like there's a habit of consumption of black women specifically if that again okay, tell me if i'm like not making sense but i don't know you're making, you're making sense um i would say there's entire social theories on um in particular capitalist societies on how um you know the protestant work ethic is uh work hard now and you'll be rewarded in the afterlife but in fact like where is life <laughs> life is now um right uh Joy is now. What could you produce? What, what, what's the outcome of what we produce when it's produced under such oppressive conditions? What is the point of life? Um, why have life? 
you know, if it's just to be toiled away and in, in labor. Um, and so, no, I, I don't think you're, you're, I don't think you're insane. There's lots of social theory around that. Um, and really around questions of, um, you know, what's, uh, what is the meaning and purpose? What is our, our function? What is our function um, as, as entities, the souls on planet earth? Um, okay, so we've got a comment in the chat and then I wanna to get to Savannah. So the comment in the chat, um, yeah. So continuing on, Nira says, uh, oh, she's just uh, agreeing with Kajani's comment. So very good, very good. All right, so uh, we'll continue because we'll weave these comments together with other Sankofas because not one person Sankofa, uh, you know, is their own, right? These, we're a web, we're a web of experiences. Um, go ahead, Savannah. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Give me one second. Um, so right off the bat, I want to say like, like I'm glad that we just had that conversation about like identity and like um, our future because it's kind of like stemming into um, like my own Sankofa. Um, and like, as we've learned before, like Sankofa is like to go back and get it and like to know your history is, um, is to know yourself. Um, and so my Sankofa, I have definitely changed it a little bit from my original uh, thought process was. Um, and now I see it as like family culture and like my identity and like what I want to do in the future. Um, and so, um, in terms of my, my family culture, um, my mom, she immigrated from Jamaica and my, my father's family is, is, uh, immigrated from Guyana. And, um, here's a little picture, um, showing my, my grandmother and her, her siblings. Um, and seeing that, um, I was thinking about like, well, it would be amazing if I, I personally, because of COVID, I haven't been able to like visit Jamaica. I haven't been able to like visit Guyana. And like now, like that meeting of Sankofa, I'm like, I was thinking about what I want in the future after I graduate. And I definitely do want to, you know, um, experience those cultures I want to visit. And I've been to Jamaica a couple of times, but it's been definitely um, a very, very long time, over 10 years. So that's one thing I definitely do want to do. Um, and again, going back um, to that idea of like identity, um, I, after graduation, I, well, this past couple of weeks, I've been kind of like reflecting on what I want out of life or like what I want to do in my future. Um, and, you know, again, going back to the idea of Sankofa, I'm, I'm still trying to reflect. I'm still trying to determine like, what is it I want? And um, yeah, so I think that I, in the past couple of weeks as well, I've made some choices in my life that I hopefully will bring me on the right track. Um, so we will see about that. But yeah, so I guess my idea of Sankofa is my family culture and um, it's my identity and um, well, what I want to do in the future. Thank you for that, Savannah. Um, comments or reflections for Savannah? <laughs> And you can go ahead and stop sharing if you'd like. Oh, uh, okay. Uh -huh. oh, I've got a couple hands up. Oh, I've got quite a few hands up. I'm not sure I didn't see which one went up first. Um, who was first? Was it you, Mira? No. Um, okay, so I'll go uh, with what I saw first. Z, Kajani, then Mira. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I really liked your presentation and love the photo like very much original very vintage I was like oh my gosh like that's yes I'm so happy we got to see that that was very personal I, I don't believe I have any like older photos like that so that's just like you know I love photos moreover what I wanted to talk about is the fact that you said after you graduate, you want to go back and travel and visit those places. Like after I graduate, like the reason for that gap year is also to travel, also exactly. to find myself, like <laughs> to eat some really good food, to do like things that make me happy, to find, you know, my roots. So yeah, I definitely get it. Like you're going back and 
trying to reconnect with that self, yourself that you've lost. And if I um, had any cultural ties and family, that's what I would be doing as well. Like, I was just reading the comment, but yes, love your presentation. Thank you for that comment, Z. Kajani. Um, like Z said, I really love that photo. I told you that the last time also, um, but I just wanted to like, um, explain like how much like I loved like your honesty of like not knowing exactly what you're going back to get and I feel like that's like with a lot of people like sometimes um just necessarily just going back to find what that you that you think that you want but you end up finding something totally different that you needed or just like um find like just turning back and um trying to feel um, the stuff that you that because you sometimes you don't know exactly what you want but you know that there's something missing and then when you go back and you find it and you feel it and it just opened your eyes to like something so new and that just really not only like I feel like your definition of Sankova really like matches perfectly like with the definition um of Sankova and I love that I think that's a wonderful point, Kajani, um, in the sense that, uh, and yes, thank you, Savannah, for bringing that up, right? This idea um, that sometimes we don't know, it's a discovery. It's a discovery of who we are. Um, and that's magical because it's not already defined, right? It becomes um, kind of an adventure an adventure. So I love that. Um, Mira, I saw that you put in the chat, you were uh, mostly wanting to comment that you were really um, liking the photo. Did you want to add anything else? I just, uh, I just think family photos are just really powerful, uh, especially when you can see like multiple generations. I just, I really love that stuff. That's all. Absolutely. Yeah. Savannah, do you want to comment back anything about the photo or the, the recapturing of that? Yeah, um, actually, I, I spoke to my mom and I'm like, do you, is there any like, or as far as I spoke to my, my dad and he, I was like, is there any pictures that I could use for like, I was talking to him about this Sankofa presentation. He was like, I know the exact one to give to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, but yeah. I mean, then that's right. That's fun when you get to share those, those, and he gets to share that photo with you, right? Exactly. Something that's important and special, special memory. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great. Z, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to talk about the photo again. Like it is just, it's giving black empowerment. It's giving, it's giving unity. It's really like, if you ever go to one of those like civil rights museums, that is like what I imagined there. Like, it is so beautiful. Like, I don't know. I was maybe want to cry when I saw it. It's like unity. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's really pulling me in for some reason. I don't know, but it's just giving. It's giving what it's supposed to have gave. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Z. I think um, old photos can um, remind us of being connected, right? To another time and place. Um, and to our ancestors as well, right? It's a, um, it's a reminder that a, a kind of anchoring, right? That we have roots and we're not just kind of free floating out there, um, undefined. Um, all right, so um, I think our last Sankofa for tonight is going to be Faith's Sankofa. Uh, and then I'll make some announcements um, at the end after, after Faith goes. So go ahead, Faith. And uh, Will you please share us share with us what Sankofa means to you? Definitely. All right. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Okay. So hold on a second. Uh, okay. So mine is just, I have a title as a lived experience. And for me, Sankofa means to go back and retrieve values from the past that have been originally lost. So for mine, I kind of just put up a couple of pictures uh, of my family and my sister. So for me, one of the part of Sankofa means to me is I grew up primarily with my mom and I didn't uh, actually get to like be part of my father's family until I was about 18, 19. Uh, this picture here is actually from uh, this, I feel like it was June of 2020, I believe, 
and I got in contact with them. And after a year of talking like over the phone and just having texting conversations and stuff, we were uh, actually finally able to meet. So I have my uncle in this picture and my grandmother in this picture and her sister and some cousins in there as well. But um, the biggest difference for me is that my uh, mother's family is per, uh, predominantly Polish. So the, there was definitely a different culture that I was that had been lost for me. And that's something that I wanted to particularly recover. Um, so for this was having this such a big family and the food experiences, uh, as well as some music experiences and uh, many other things with this. However, one of the biggest parts for me uh, that have changed since my, I've done my Sankofa first was culture was a really big thing for me, but I think building the relationships and strengthening them was something that I, I, I needed to retrieve from the past. And in this was uh, finding 23andMe and finding my sister through that, uh, to which I, that happened in 2019. And these two pictures are actually from September of 2021 when I flew up to Ohio to finally meet her for the first time. So this was something that was really, really big for me in retrieving uh, part of my past and actually rebuilding and uh, creating new memories. And that's the end of that. Thank you, Faith. Um, and thank you for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, um, feedback and comment. Julia, go ahead. Um, I just really like how, uh, I, I think you had one of the pictures there before when you did it, but I really like seeing the pictures of your sister. Um, and I just think it's so cool that you were able to like, you did that test and it like allowed you to be able to find her and you made that um, jump to go actually see her. And so I just think that's really special. And I liked how you elaborated on the fact of like, not only just like culture, but like also making those connections with family. Yes, thank you for that, Julia. I think that um, 23 and me is such an interesting way, right? Like what a what like what an amazing um, Sankofa that you would find um, a family, family, um, a sister like this. Um, you've got some comments and then I'm gonna come to Kajani's um, hand. Um, uh, beautiful family. Everyone says beautiful family. I see you've responded already, Faith. Do you wanna say anything else before I go to Kajani? No, you're good. All right, good, Johnny, go ahead. Um, just being like a family oriented person, like when I tell you, like, like core, like one family is like one of my core values. Like, I grew up with my siblings, like I mean, my cousins as like siblings, and even though I already had like eight siblings in one house, like my siblings was there like every day. Like when I tell you, full house to the max. So like, um, Faith and Julia presentation like really resonated with me. Um, going back, like because so so much of us grew up and moved away, and like we just like from our childhood home, and I was like the last one living our childhood home and let me tell you the worst feeling ever like silence I hate it because like I just grew up with so much noise like so like it's just the feeling of like silence is like so foreign to me and just like um you guys talking about going back um and like retrieving like these familial ties like even like now like just learning to, like learning my siblings or like my cousins over again as they grow into like new people I, I just like love that experience. And I love that like other people get to like experience that experience. And I just like, yeah, I just love it so much. And I see that in your photos and I'm so happy for you for getting to like experience that. Cause I know like how beautiful it feels. Thank you, Kajani. Um, yeah, it also like, um, right. Our, our roots, our family um, of origin are, um, our, uh, what do they call them? The family that you create friends, right? Um, there's so, there's so much of a central part of who we are and the families that we make. Um, and so, whoop. oh, <laughs> cat drama. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, <laughs> so I'll have to go check on that. Um, Hmm. Um, so let me continue though to say, uh, um, I have a, a niece 
who was born in August, I haven't seen, you know, and um, it's my baby sister who uh, we, I have a, that same large, you know, I think there's someone, uh, Zeke talked about having like a large age difference. Um, I'm the oldest and there's a 23 year age difference between the youngest or five of us and the youngest just had a, a baby and actually me and her are the only two with um, children. Everyone else doesn't have children. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting and in how, you know, again, wanting to connect. I mean, definitely that's, that's part of like, what's changing for me is like kind of also getting my Sankofa. So that also resonates with my story. So family um, and the people around us and, and really thinking about how um, the past is shaping the present and then the present, right? Provides us with a future. Um, other comments? Okay, well, um, you guys, this has been great. Thank you all for sharing your Sankofas. Um, I'm going to ask the class to hang out for a minute, but I'm gonna close out the, the recording. Um, so this is uh, the first week we discussed Sankofa. Next week, we're gonna do 13th, the documentary. And we'll continue to um, talk about different Sankofas over the next um, six weeks. So students will have an opportunity who didn't present tonight to continue on with their presentations in future, um, in future uh, sessions. And then, um, if you're watching this, um, this is, um, or, you know, uh, it'll be on YouTube and every week will be available on YouTube for viewing at a later time. Um, so thank you guys, everybody for sharing your stories tonight class. You guys did great. Um, and see you guys next week. Bye.